History of England, Chapter Nine, Part Fifteen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Chapter Nine, Part Fifteen. On Sunday, the eleventh of November. Burnet preached before the prince in the cathedral, and dilated on the signal mercy vouchsafed by God to the English church and nation. At the same time a singular event happened in a humbler place of worship. Ferguson resolved to preach at the Presbyterian meeting-house. The minister and elders would not consent, but the turbulent and half-witted knave, fancying that the times of Fleetwood and Harrison were come again, forced the door, went through the congregation sword in hand, mounted the pulpit, and there poured forth a fiery invective against the king. The time for such follies had gone by, and this exhibition excited nothing but derision and disgust. While these things were passing in Devonshire, the ferment was greater in London. The Prince's declaration, in spite of all precautions, was now in every man's hands. On the 6th of November, James, still uncertain on what part of the coast the invaders had landed, summoned the Primate and three other bishops, Compton of London, White of Peterborough, and Spratt of Rochester, to a conference in the closet. The King listened graciously while the prelates made warm professions of loyalty, and assured them that he did not suspect them. "'But where,' said he, "'is the paper that you were to bring me?' "'Sir,' answered Sancroft, "'we brought no paper. We are not solicitous to clear our fame to the world. It is no new thing to us to be reviled and falsely accused. Our consciences acquit us, your Majesty acquits us, and we are satisfied.' Yes, said the king, but a declaration from you is necessary to my service. He then produced a copy of the prince's manifesto. See, he said, how you are mentioned here. Sir, answered one of the bishops, not one person in five hundred believes this manifesto to be genuine. No, cried the king fiercely, then those five hundred would bring the prince of Orange to cut my throat. God forbid, exclaimed the prelates in concert. But the king's understanding, never very clear, was now quite bewildered. One of his peculiarities was that, whenever his opinion was not adopted, he fancied that his veracity was questioned. "'This paper not genuine!' he exclaimed, turning over the leaves with his hands. "'Am I not worthy to be believed? Is my word not to be taken?' "'At all events, sir,' said one of the bishops, "'this is not an ecclesiastical matter.' it lies within the sphere of the civil power god has entrusted your majesty with the sword and it is not for us to invade your functions then the archbishop with that gentle and temperate malice which inflicts the deepest wounds declared that he must be excused from setting his hand to any political document i and my brethren sir he said have already smarted severely for meddling with affairs of state and we shall be very cautious how we do so again we once subscribed a petition of the most harmless kind we presented it in the most respectful manner and we found that we had committed a high offence we were saved from ruin only by the merciful protection of god and sir the ground then taken by your majesty's attorney and solicitor was that out of parliament we were private men and that it was criminal presumption in private men to meddle with politics they attacked us so fiercely that for my part i gave myself over for lost i thank you for that my lord of canterbury said the king i should have hoped that you would not have thought yourself lost by falling into my hands such a speech might have become the mouth of a merciful sovereign, but it came with a bad grace from a prince who had burned a woman alive for harbouring one of his flying enemies, from a prince around whose knees his own nephew had clung in vain agonies of supplication. The archbishop was not to be so silenced. He resumed his story, and recounted the insults which the creatures of the court had offered to the Church of England among which some ridicule thrown on his own style occupied a conspicuous place. 
The King had nothing to say but that there was no use in repeating old grievances, and that he had hoped that these things were quite forgotten. He, who never forgot the smallest injury that he had suffered, could not understand how others should remember for a few weeks the most deadly injuries that he had inflicted. At length the conversation came back to the point from which it had wandered. The King insisted on having from the bishops a paper declaring their abhorrence of the Prince's enterprise. They, with many professions of the most submissive loyalty, pertinaciously refused. The Prince, they said, asserted that he had been invited by temporal as well as by spiritual peers. The imputation was common. Why should not the purgation be common also? "'I see how it is,' said the King. Some of the temporal peers have been with you, and have persuaded you to cross me in this matter." The bishops solemnly averred that it was not so, but it would, they said, seem strange that, on a question involving grave political and military considerations, the temporal peers should be entirely passed over, and the prelates alone should be required to take a prominent part. "'But this,' said James, "'is my method. I am your king. It is for me to judge what is best. I will go my own way, and I call on you to assist me." The bishops assured him that they would assist him in their proper department, as Christian ministers with their prayers, and as peers of the realm with the, his, their advice in his Parliament. James, who wanted neither the prayers of heretics nor the advice of Parliaments, was bitterly disappointed. After a long altercation, "'I have done,' he said. "'I will urge you no further. Since you will not help me, I must trust to myself and to my own arms." The bishops had hardly left the royal presence, when a courier arrived with the news that on the preceding day the Prince of Orange had landed in Devonshire. During the following week London was violently agitated. On Sunday, the 11th of November, a rumour was circulated that knives, gridirons, and cauldrons intended for the torturing of heretics were concealed in the monastery which had been established under the King's protection at Clerkenwell. Great multitudes assembled around the building, and were about to demolish it when a military force arrived. The crowd was dispersed, and several of the rioters were slain. An inquest sat on the bodies, and came to a decision which strongly indicated the temper of the public mind. The jury found that certain loyal and well-disposed persons, who had gone to put down the meetings of traitors and public enemies at a mass-house, had been willfully murdered by the soldiers, and this strange verdict was signed by all the jurors. The ecclesiastics at Clerkenwell, naturally alarmed by these symptoms of popular feeling, were desirous to place their property in safety. They succeeded in removing most of their furniture before any report of their intentions got abroad, but at length the suspicions of the rabble were excited. The last two carts were stopped in Hoban, and all that they contained was publicly burned in the middle of the street. So great was the alarm among the Catholics that all their places of worship were closed, except those which belonged to the royal family and to foreign ambassadors. On the whole, however, things as yet looked not unfavourably for James. The invaders had been more than a week on English ground, yet no man of note had joined them. No rebellion had broken out in the north or the east. No servant of the crown appeared to have betrayed his trust. The royal army was assembling fast at Salisbury, and, though inferior in discipline to that of William, was superior in numbers. The Prince was undoubtedly surprised and mortified by the slackness of those who had invited him to England. By the common people of Devonshire, indeed, he had been received with every sign of good will, but no nobleman, no gentleman of high consideration, had yet repaired to his quarters. The explanation of this singular fact is probably to be found in the circumstance that he had landed in a part of the island where he had not been expected. His friends in the north had made their arrangements for a rising, on the supposition that he would be among them with an army. His friends in the west had made no arrangements at all, and were naturally disconcerted at finding themselves suddenly called upon to take the lead in a movement so important and perilous. They had also, fresh in their recollection, and indeed full in their sight, the disastrous consequences of rebellion gibbets, heads, mangled quarters, families still in deep mourning for brave sufferers who had loved their country well but not wisely. 
after a warning so terrible and so recent, some hesitation was natural. It was equally natural, however, that William, who, trusting to promises from England, had put to hazard not only his own fame and fortunes, but also the prosperity and independence of his native land, should feel deeply mortified. He was, indeed, so indignant that he talked of falling back to Torbay, re-embarking his troops, returning to Holland, and leaving those who had betrayed him to the fate which they deserved. At length, on Monday, the 12th of November, a gentleman named Burrington, who resided in the neighbourhood of Crediton, joined the Prince's standard, and his example was followed by several of his neighbours. Men of higher consequence had already set out from different parts of the country for Exeter. The first of these was John Lord Lovelace, distinguished by his taste, by his magnificence, and by the audacious and intemperate vehemence of his Whiggism. He had been five or six times arrested for political offences. The last crime laid to his charge was that he had contemptuously denied the validity of a warrant signed by a Roman Catholic Justice of the Peace. He had been brought before the Privy Council and strictly examined, but to little purpose. He resolutely refused to criminate himself, and the evidence against him was insufficient. He was dismissed, but before he retired James exclaimed in great heat, "'My lord!' "'This is not the first trick you have played on me.' "'Sir,' answered Lovelace, with undaunted spirit, "'I never played any trick to your Majesty, or to any other person. Whoever has accused me to your Majesty of playing tricks is a liar.' Lovelace had subsequently been admitted into the confidence of those who planned the revolution. His mansion, built by his ancestors out of the spoils of Spanish galleons from the Indies, rose on the ruins of a house of Our Lady, in that beautiful valley through which the Thames, not yet defiled by the precincts of a great capital, nor rising and falling with the flow and ebb of the sea, rolls under woods of beech, around the gentle hills of Berkshire. Beneath the stately saloon, adorned by Italian pencils, was a subterraneous vault, in which the bones of ancient monks had sometimes been found. In this dark chamber some zealous and daring opponents of the government held many midnight conferences during that anxious time when England was impatiently expecting the Protestant wind. The season for action had now arrived. Lovelace, with seventy followers, well armed and mounted, quitted his dwelling and directed his course westward. He reached Gloucestershire without difficulty, but Beaufort, who governed that county, was exerting all his great authority and influence in support of the Crown. The militia had been called out. A strong party had been posted at Sirencester. When Lovelace arrived there, he was informed that he could not be suffered to pass. It was necessary for him either to relinquish his undertaking, or to fight his way through. He resolved to force a passage, and his friends and tenants stood gallantly by him. A sharp conflict took place. The militia lost an officer and six or seven men, but at length the followers of Lovelace were overpowered. He was made a prisoner, and sent to Gloucester Castle. Others were more fortunate. On the same day in which the skirmish took place at Sirencester, Richard Savage, Lord Colchester, son and heir of the Earl Rivers, and father by a lawless amour of that unhappy poet whose misdeeds and misfortunes form one of the darkest portions of literary history, came with between sixty and seventy horse to Exeter. With him arrived the bold and turbulent Thomas Wharton. A few hours later came Edward Russell, son of the Earl of Bedford, and brother of the virtuous nobleman whose blood had been shed on the scaffold. Another arrival, still more important, was speedily announced. Colchester, Wharton, and Russell belonged to that party which had been constantly opposed to the court. James Barty, Earl of Abingdon, had, on the contrary, been regarded as a supporter of arbitrary government. He had been true to James in the days of the Exclusion Bill. He had, as Lord Lieutenant of Oxfordshire, acted with vigour and severity against the adherents of Monmouth, and had lighted bonfires to celebrate the defeat of Argyle, but dread of popery had driven him into opposition and rebellion. He was the first peer of the realm who made his appearance at the quarters of the Prince of Orange. 
End of part 15